Thanks, Bill. So yeah, uh, this work was done in Maryland, so not part of the South, but as we just heard, low sal salinity is definitely relevant and um, impacts all the industry down here in the South. So this work was done um, at the University of Maryland with my old advisor, Lewis Plow. So it looks like these words are messed up a little bit. So, <laughs> but um, as everyone here probably knows, low salinity negatively impacts many physiological functions in eastern oysters. It reduces valve opening, respiration rates, clearance rates, and filtration rates, which impacts an oyster's ability to eat. Um, and therefore, in low salinity, there's massive reductions in growth. And this can re reduce the time it takes uh, an oyster to get to harvestable size, which for a business impacts your profit if you can't harvest your oysters. And it can also create a backlog of crop, um, so not yet harvestable size. And then negative effects from low salinity are intensified at increased temperatures. So in Maryland and other coastal areas, we have this dual stressor of these extreme low salinity events. And I should mention, I'm talking about extreme, so like less than three, because low salinity is relative, as I have heard <laughs> the past couple of days. Um, but so in Maryland and other areas, there's this dual stressor of it, it's super low, low salinity and then increased temperatures, which kind of in, increases these negative impacts. So in Maryland, um, we saw in 2018 uh, a heavy precipitation event, which coincided with my PhD, and so it was kind of perfect. But um, so this graph here shows the mean salinity in the Chop Tank River, which is in Maryland in the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the black line is the average from 2008 to 2017. And then in 2018, the blue line in the early spring, the rain started and they continued and salinity plummeted all the way down to five and remained low in the red line uh, all the way through 2019 until like early fall. So very low, um, less than five in the Chop Tank River um, for a long period of time. And this resulted in some mass mortality within the bay. So this, uh, these are the Maryland fall dredge surveys in the Chesapeake Bay. So it shows the percent of oysters dead. The red is more than 50%. So you can just see from 2017 on the left, there's really no mass mortality. And then 2018 in the middle, we have some massive mortalities up in the kind of northern portions of some of these tributaries. And then in 2019, even more um, mass mortality from low salinity. And to bring it to the south, <laughs> it's also relevant here. So this 2018, 2019 heavy rainfall, uh, and this is from a report, um, it says the Mississippi River flood was the longest lasting flood on record since the 1900s. That they open when the Mississippi River floods, the, they open the spillway, and so they had to open it twice in 2019 um, for a total of 123 days. And this extreme, when you open the spillway, you have all that fresh water that flows into um, the bay there. And so the extreme influx of fresh water greatly reduced salinity levels in the coastal waters of Louisiana. And this graph here just shows the um, oyster landings in Louisiana, and then in 2018 and 2019, they were severely reduced. And part of that reason is due to the heavy rainfall events. So low salinity, extreme low salinity following these heavy rainfall events is an issue. And so from my dissertation, we looked at the genetic basis and breeding potential of extreme low salinity for the eastern oyster. So the first step of this is to determine if the trait is heritable. So can it be passed from parents to offspring? And then if it can be and it is heritable, what does the genetic structure look like? Is it controlled by one gene, a couple genes, or is it controlled by lots of genes? So the first step, is it heritable? So to do this, um, we developed a progeny test. So it's basically a laboratory challenge where you can look at and control the parameters. So we're specifically looking at this extreme low salinity. And you get a uh, measurable variation in your survival across a variety of animals. And so from that, you can estimate the heritability, which is this big scientific definition, but it's pretty much the proportion of the variation, that trait that's due to genetics. And so it can be passed from parent to offspring. So this is inside the lab at Horn Point. Um, we use these big tanks and we used families of oysters from um, ABC at VIM, so the low salinity lines. And so these families have half sibling, full sibling relationships, which just allows us to track the relationship to estimate the heritability values. And so we put these oysters in the tanks in these Taylor floats. Um, we lowered the salinity and 
hand mixed with ambient shop tank water and then well water. And so the oysters were allowed to acclimate for a week. And then over two days, we lowered the salinity to 2.5 and increased the temperature to 27. And we left them at this stressor for 30 days. And then every day we would pull the floats, check for live or dead, um, and record that information. So I did a total of seven of these challenges uh, over my four years. And so I made these graphs small because I don't really want you to look at them. <laughs> um, but you can see the general trend. So on the left here, we did two challenges in 2018. And then the right is two different challenges in 2019. And so we saw that mortality differed across the families in all of those challenges across different years and with different animals. So this suggests that there is a genetic component underlying this trait. And so when you put a heritability value to that, it was zero, around 0 0.4, which just means that 40% of the variation in that trait is due to the genetics. So step one, that's good. The trait is heritable, so it seems like it can be passed from parent to offspring, which is good when you're thinking about selectively breeding for a trait. So the next step, what does the genetic structure look like? So I did another challenge um, with a different set of animals. And from, this, from these animals, they were in the same challenge, so low salinity, high temperature for 30 days. And when the oysters died, I collected tissue samples. And then for all the animals that were alive at the end, I also collected tissue samples, uh, extracted DNA, and then sent the DNA for sequencing at thousands of markers across the genome. And I just want to go over what a marker is. Uh, so this is very simplified picture here that I put together, but we have four different oysters here, and these are like an example of a sequence, a genomic sequence, and you can see they're the same for all the oysters except at the two areas that I've circled. So this is what we call like a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. So if there's a difference in that one region of the genome. And so these markers we can then look at and correlate with our traits of interest which is what we did here. So this is a Manhattan plot. Each of these dots is a different one of those variations in the genome between the animals that we tested. And so they're plotted in their location on the genome, so across the 10 chromosomes, and then the y-axis is just their significance. And so you can see here on chromosome one, there seems to be a, a peak. So there's a region there that correlated with survival in our challenges. But I will say that that peak is hundreds of markers, and those, all those markers only accounted for 10% of the variation, which is not really substantial. So from this, it looks like this trait is controlled by many genes of small effects, so more than just is on that chromosome one. And so when you have a trait that's controlled by many genes, a potential good breeding approach is genomic selection. And genomic selection is where you select individuals for breeding based on the combined effect of all relevant genes across the genome. So instead of, like in this picture here, instead of just selecting for those markers on chromosome one, you're selecting for everything that contributes to the trait. So even the ones that are super, super small. And so this results in higher rates of genetic gain because you're capturing all of those small effects. And so we looked at this, again, don't really look at the graph, but we looked at this preliminarily in our data set. And so we have these prediction accuracies, which is how accurately can you predict an animal's survival based on their genes. And so our values range from 0 0.48 to 0 0.57, which doesn't really mean anything, but it's good in the world of genomic selection. That's a pretty good um, and comparable in the literature to other species. So this just, again, is solidifying that this trait seems to be controlled in our population and our challenges by many genes of small effect and genomic selection may be a good approach um, for breeding for this trait. So some conclusions from this work. Extreme low salinity is a heritable trait, which is very encouraging and exciting. Um, and when we think about breeding for this trait, it's going to improve oyster productivity in low salinity regions, such as those in Maryland and Louisiana um, and elsewhere down here in the south. And it will also allow for aquaculture to maybe expand further into some of these areas. And then as we just heard, when we think about climate change and the increases in heavy precipitation events and extreme storms, um, this is going to increase the resiliency of the industry moving forward. So I just want to put a little plug for the low spat project. So my adv old advisor is now um, working with his postdoc student and looking at 
a lot of the stuff I did, but for Louisiana specifically. So the Low Spat Project is leveraging opportunities and strategic partnerships to advance tolerant oysters for restoration. So it was launched in 2021 to address the concerns of the declining oyster populations in uh, Louisiana. So it has four main goals, and they're focusing on Goal one, um, so developing these genomic selection methods and identifying candidate broodstock specific to Louisiana. So using some of the same, um, the same challenge with animals from three different regions in Louisiana. So stay tuned for, um, wow, my text got really messed up, but stay tuned for, for these results because um, hopefully they'll, they'll have some stuff coming that'll be really relevant for the southern industry. All right, thanks, Lexi. We have some time for questions. Yep. Is this on? Yes. Um, I've worked on hatchery designs in the Chesapeake Bay a bit over a number of years. Recently, it occurred to me, is it possible that, and I'm an engineer, not a biologist, the motility of the animal is influenced by salinity and its density? and thus the animal has to work harder to, to, to live in that, that environment? An oyster to live in a low salinity environment? Um, well, they don't move, I guess, from the motility standpoint. They, they are, when they set, they don't, they're there for the rest of their lives. But it is a very stressful, low salinity is very stressful. For, maybe I don't understand. Do you mean in the larval stage? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I looked at adults, but yes, the larval stage in low salinity is probably. Matt, you, I, I got you. By the way, um, before I hand it to Stoop, um, we are recording this and we have the PowerPoint, and I'll work with Lexi. Sorry, uh, <laughs> things were uploaded to Google Drive, downloaded to a Mac, um, things happen. So I, I'm sorry, okay. Lexi, and we'll get those fixed it's for you. Fine. I'm curious on your opinion, so let's continue the talk on moving oysters. Um, a very low salinity oyster doesn't taste very good, uh, yet an aquaculturist or farmer may decide to, to move them to a higher salinity area for a brief period to make them more marketable. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your opinion on how hardy a, 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 a low salinity oyster would be to moving to a high salinity? I recognize there's old information that you should step it up 10% each time. But uh, some farmers don't have that uh, time to do that, so I'm curious. Yeah, and so I don't think the point is to breed for oysters to live in this below three. It's more so for these fresh out events, um, breeding some of this tolerance. And so if there's heavy rainfalls, can we just get those oysters to survive before salinity increases? So yes, a, an oyster in three, and I can contest because I've eaten some of my experimental ones. They don't taste great. Um, but more in these lower areas. And so your question was moving them to higher. I guess it's probably all, if you move them at a slower rate, I think they would be um, better suited and survive better. But, and I'm in Maryland, and so our salinity there is like nine to 11, it's lower. So they'll never go to a salinity of like 30. So like down here, as I've learned, you know, they can hit two and then they can go all the way up to like 40. So I think going higher salinity is still a very stressful um, event, but I, I think if you breed a little bit of this into it, I think they should be fine though if you move them up depending on the population and what they normally see on average. I don't think the Maryland ones would do well in, in 30, but <laughs> yeah, if that answers your question, yeah. Lexi, I have a question for you. In terms of uh, I don't know where you are. meat production, oh. <laughs> not for the half shell market, I've heard that uh, maximum meat production can be gained in low salinity. Have, is that something that you're aware of? Is it true? Um, has your breeding been focused around that market at all? No, I'm not familiar with that. And we looked at strictly survival. Um, in low salinity, so we didn't look at really the other traits related with that, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, Matt's got you. 
Uh, from your challenges, what was the percent mortality that you had? And did you perform condition index on any of the survivors to see if anyone was better than the rest? I did not do condition index. And so across all of my challenges, mortality was like 30 to 60% cumulative. Um, range depend on if I did it in the spring versus later in the summer, there was higher mortality in summer challenges. Um, so yeah, overall 30. Some families though had 100% mortalities, others had three. Lexi, I'll just ask one quick question, I think. Like, so I agree with you that my understanding of the Louisiana project is to breed oysters to tolerate low salinity events, not thrive there, yeah. you just want them to tolerate. Yeah. With the talk about mortalities yesterday, there was some talk about how the change in temperature or the change in salinities seem to often be associated with the mortalities. Is the genomic approach that you're talking about here, do you think that's a useful way? Can you select for ability to tolerate change in salinity? Yes. Um, I guess it's what is the level of that change. Um, like this, this would be selecting for a super extreme, um, and then you could probably select for a super high, and I mean, ABC has a breeding program for six to 11, so like a middle low. So yeah, I think, I think, yeah. All right, well thanks Lexi, appreciate it. The, okay.